Well, why don't we pray, and then we're going to come to God's Word. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for a brand new year that you've made. Father, I thank you that in this new year, God, it is just full of possibility. God, I thank you that your Holy Spirit is in every one of our auditoriums right now, just hovering, ready to spark dreams and ignite imagination. Father, we thank you that we have not even yet dreamt of the things that you could do in and through our lives this year. So by your Holy Spirit, God, I just pray that you would release those things in our heart and mind. Even this morning, I pray. Father, encourage us, inspire us, lift our thinking, I pray. In Jesus' name, everyone said... Well, I believe that God has given to every single human being two important gifts. God has given you and I the ability to dream, and God has given to each of us the ability to do. Who knows, every person has got the capacity to dream. Uh, Kids are particularly good at dreaming. I mean, kids are experts when it comes to imagination. Uh, Sarah and I have got three little children. I was last week talking to Hugo and Luca, that's my four-year-old and our two-and-a-half-year-old girl, and I said to Hugo, what do you want to do when you grow up? And he didn't hesitate. He said, when I grow up, I want to be a policeman. And I thought, that figures, because you're always bossing everyone around in the house. He's the eldest. And then I said to my two-and-a-half-year-old girl, Luca, what do you want to do when you grow up? And she very quickly exclaimed, Daddy, when I grow up, I want to be a water bottle. (laughs) And so just just pray for Luca, because we're still working on her dreams for the future. But who knows, when you're a kid, why not? Kids just imagine stuff. But what I've found is often the imagination that flows freely in the life of a child can sometimes become dull, can even become dormant as we grow older. We get into routine, we can get into ruts, we can have some disappointments, which cause us to lower our expectations and to lower our vision. But I believe that the gift of imagination it is not just child's play. I believe that imagination is actually the language of faith. I believe that God wants to spark your imagination this year to help you to dream dreams and to see visions of what God could do in the future. In fact, it doesn't matter where you are at the start of a new year. It doesn't even matter how you are at the start of a brand new year. C.S. Lewis said, you're never too old to set a new goal or to dream a new dream. Can I add to that? You're never too old. You're never too young. You're never too poor and you're never too rich. You're never too broken. And who knows, you're never too successful to be able to dream a new dream and to set a new goal. And so God has given every single person here this morning the power to dream. But secondly, God has also given us the power to do. God doesn't want us just to be dreamers who are full of imagination and ideas, but never do anything. God has given us the capacity to do. Who knows, so long as the sun comes up and you've got breath in your lungs, then you and I are not powerless. Some of us might feel like we're just passive spectators to the drama of life. Some of us feel like we're just victims of circumstance, but I want to encourage you this morning, you are made in the image of God, and you've been made with the capacity to create and to build. God has given you time, God has given you talents, God has given you opportunities, God has given you social connections. You've got a mind, you've got a body, you've got hands, you've got feet, you've got a mouth, you've got a backbone. Who knows, God has given you all of these things so that you're not just a dreamer, but you can also be a doer. Who knows, on top of that, if you're a follower of Jesus, God has given you the Holy Spirit who fills you with power and with ability to be able to do the things that God has called us to do. And so I want to start a new year by reminding you that God has given you the power to dream and God has given us the power to do. And who knows, good success actually requires that we use both of those gifts. Good success requires that we dream and it requires that we be willing to do. We need imagination and we need action. We need faith to dream, and we need wisdom to do. And so today, we're kick-starting a two-part series, which we've called Grand Plans. Everyone say, Grand Plans. And Small Steps. Say, Small Steps. Who knows, a lot of people have got faith for grand plans, but never have the wisdom to take small steps. A lot of people are very busy taking small steps, 
but never exercise their imagination to make grand plans. But I believe this is a great season for our church and for you individually to set grand plans by the Spirit of God and also to have the wisdom to take small steps. And so over the next two Sundays, I want us to consider together how God worked in the life of the Old Testament figure Abraham, because Abraham is a great example to us of what it means to believe a grand plan and yet be willing to take small steps. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3 says, The Lord had said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Let me share this morning four benefits of a grand plan. Just give me a wave across our campuses if you have already set your New Year's resolutions for the year. Just give us a quick wave. Where are all those people? Give us a wave. You're one of those people. You're in that lull where you're not sure what day of the week it is. You're just pretty proud that you made it to church today. (laughs) On the Sunshine Coast, that's the far majority. Four benefits of a grand plan. And I'm really believing this, that God's Word would really start to inspire and frame our thinking as this week or over the coming weeks, we sit down and shape our plans for the year ahead. Here's the first benefit. Number one, grand plans will make you like God. Well, there's a big statement. Grand plans will actually make you like God. Maybe you've never considered this, but setting grand plans and dreaming big dreams, it is not at all foreign to the nature of God. Some of us think that God is only into arbitrary commands and laws and that God is a sheer stark realist, but God himself is a dreamer. Creation proves it. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 3, 1 to 3 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. For all intents and purposes, the Bible says that the earth was without form. In other words, it was out of shape. Can anyone relate post-Christmas? The earth was out of shape, it was empty, it was dark, and it seemed hopeless. And yet when God looked at an earth that was out of shape, empty, dark, and hopeless, God didn't look at it and think, oh, well, it's only ever going to be out of shape, empty, dark, and hopeless. Rather, God looked at it with the eye of faith, and God had a dream in his mind. God could see oceans and forests and galaxies and glaciers. God could see planets and the moon and the sun. And God could see Mooloolaba and Yapoon and Rockhampton and the Gold Coast. And God could see trees and birds and wildlife. Who knows, before any of it was ever visible, God dreamed it up and then God spoke it out. And so God himself is a dreamer, not just in creation, but in our salvation, God was a dreamer. The Bible talks about our salvation as being the eternal plan of salvation. And so salvation didn't happen accidentally or haphazardly, but rather our salvation, our redemption, the fact that Jesus would die upon the cross for our sin was actually a dream in the mind of God so that you and I could be holy and faultless before Him. God dreamed that up before the foundation of the world. The Bible says that Jesus at 12 years of age said, I must be about my father's business. Jesus is 12 and he's got vision. Uh, The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 that Jesus, because of the joy set before him, he endured the cross, which means this, that not just in creation, but also in salvation, we see that God is a dreamer. I wonder if you've ever thought about this, that you began, not as a twinkle in your father's eye, you began as a dream in the mind of God. I wonder if you've ever thought that. Psalm 139 and verse 16 tells us that all the days ordained for you and I were written in God's book before one of them came to be. I want to encourage you this morning. You're a dream. Don't listen to the negative press. You were a dream in the mind of God. And when God dreamed you up, he wasn't having a nightmare. When God dreamed you up, it was a good dream. And so God in creation, God dreamed in salvation. God dreamed it up in terms of your life and your destiny. God dreamed it up. And so when we get to Genesis chapter 12, we see that God 
has a dream. God has got a grand plan which includes Abraham. God looks down the corridor of time and God saw that through Abraham's lineage, through Abraham's seed, would come the Son of God, would come the Messiah, who would be the one who would be the blessing to all the nations of the earth. You know, about 2,100 years after Genesis chapter 12, we read in Matthew chapter 1 of the birth of Jesus Christ, and it says, this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So God, 2,100 years out, is dreaming of the day when Jesus would be born into human history as the son of Abraham, and that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through him. Well, you might say, well, what, what does all of that mean for me? That's kind of nice Bible history, but what does that mean? It means this, that when you sit down this week and look at your life, and who knows, sometimes you look at your life and there's parts of your life that are out of shape. Come on, let's not be all Christian on Sunday. Who knows, there's parts of our life that you wish were in better shape. Uh, maybe it's just the preacher. Stop looking at me, you're all inspecting me. Look, we all just loosen the belt a little bit over Christmas, all right? There's parts of our lives that are out of shape and feel empty and feel dark and feel hopeless. When you sit down and start to dream, that's not just hype. That's not just positivity. That's not something that Dr. Phil or Oprah came up with. To sit down and to look at a life or a world that is not yet fully in shape and is not yet reaching its full potential and yet to start to dream, to start to see things with the eye of faith, to start to see where your family could be, to start to see where your business could be, to start to see your children serving God and making a difference. When you start to look with eyes of faith and dream a great dream, that's not something unspiritual. That's something that reflects the nature of God himself. You are never more like God than when you're dreaming a great dream for the future. In Jeremiah 29 and verse 11, God says, I know the plans that I have for you and they're plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. Now, this might just be the most quoted scripture from the Bible in all of Christendom. We see this scripture on walls, we see it on coffee mugs, we see it on social media, and uh, perhaps it's one of the most encouraging verses in the Bible, but you know, it's even more encouraging when you understand where Israel were when God spoke that promise to them. It was spoken by Jeremiah, who was a prophet to Israel while they were in exile. Israel had been taken captive by King Nebuchadnezzar, and they had been dragged into Babylon, dragged away from their homeland. And so they're despondent, things haven't gone how they thought they would go. And then in Jeremiah chapter 29, God is encouraging Israel, listen, I've not forgotten you. I'm still going to fulfill my promise toward you. I've still got a great future for your life. And so Israel was able to start to make grand plans in the knowledge that God himself still had a grand plan for their lives. And some of us would look at 2019 or maybe the last few years and say, man, it feels out of shape. It feels void. It feels like it's not going according to my plans. I want to tell you that God still has a great plan for your life. God has not forgotten you. God is still going to fulfill his promise toward you. And it's in the knowledge that God has a grand plan that we can get on and make grand plans. And so when you can look at a world that is out of shape and void and dream, you're acting like God. When you can look at an Abraham and Sarah who are barren and yet see children, you're acting like God. When you can uh, look at a world where nothing has gone to plan and you feel like you're in exile and yet you still believe God's got a great plan for me. Oh, I can still dream even in Babylon. When you're doing that, you're acting like God himself. Can you say amen this morning? Number two is this grand plans will move you from fatalism into faith. You know, many of us uh, relinquish responsibility for our future and we kind of resign ourselves to fate. And, uh, you know, we, we can start to passively accept the status quo and develop a defeated mindset because, you know, when I was a teenager, I had grand plans, but, you know, things haven't really gone according to plan and now I'm just kind of getting by and it's all too hard and you've just got to roll with the punches. And, you know, many of us can passively resign our future over to fate. God doesn't want us to do that. God wants us to be in faith, not fate. And faith is the ability to look at a future and still have hope, even when 
it seems like there's nothing to hope in. In 1939 in Pennsylvania, there was a nine-year-old boy called James Irwin who was at home with his mum and dad. And uh, he finished his dinner and was playing. His mum, as mums do, sent him upstairs to go to bed. And about an hour later, mum popped into the little boy's bedroom to find that he had not yet fallen asleep. In fact, he was nowhere near asleep. Instead, he was staring out the window, looking at the full moon, and just transfixed as he looked at the moon. Well, he's nine years of age. His mum walks in and says, what are you doing? Go to bed. And at nine years of age, in 1939, James Irwin says to his mum, mum, one day I'm going to walk on the moon. This is long before Neil Armstrong or anyone had even began to do anything like that. Well, a few years later, that young boy, as a young adult, was involved in a motorcycle accident and broke almost every bone in his body. Many people at that point would say, well, what good is a dream? I could never do it now. And yet James Irwin made a full recovery after the motorbike accident, then submitted himself to the gruelling program that was outlined by NASA. And uh, instead of conceding defeat, he still believed the dream that he had in his heart as a nine-year-old. And on August 1st, 1971, he became the eighth man to ever walk on the moon as part of the Apollo 15 mission. Why is that? It's because... When you get a grand plan, a grand plan is able to shift you out of a mindset of fatalism and into a mindset of faith. Uh, if there was ever anyone who could have made excuses, it was Abraham. At the end of Genesis chapter 11, we read that Abraham and his family had set out to go from Ur of the Chaldeans to the land of Canaan. But midway on their journey, they stopped at Haran, which literally means a mountainous place or a difficult place and there in that difficult place, Abraham's father dies. So check this out. You've got Abraham. His wife is childless. Their plans have fallen apart at the seams. His father has died. And they're in a mountainous and difficult place. Who knows if there was ever a moment to quit, that's the moment. If there was ever a moment to say, maybe we dreamed a little bit too big, then that was the moment. And yet God came to Abraham in the midst of that place with a grand plan. Abraham is a nomad, and yet God gives him a dream of land. Abraham is childless, and yet God gives him a dream of descendants. And look at what happens in Genesis chapter 12, verse 4, right after God gives Abraham the grand plan. It says, so Abraham went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Did you see what happened there? The moment Abraham got a grand plan from God, suddenly he's up and moving. Abraham has been stuck in a rut for an indefinite period of time, but the moment he gets a plan from God, he sets out because now he's got something to go after. You know, the reason so many people get caught in a rut and their lives become Groundhog Day is because they never set a grand plan, but it's amazing how when you get a vision for your future, when you get a grand plan in sight, it's amazing. You can be 75 years of age and yet you get the ability to get up and go because God has given you something to go for. In Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 2, God says, write the vision and make it plain so that he may run who reads it. Did you see the link there? Vision has the ability to get you moving. Vision has the ability to get you stuck. Maybe you feel stuck in business or, or stuck in your family life or stuck emotionally. I want to encourage you, what if God could breathe into your heart a grand plan for the year ahead? Because if a grand plan could get Abraham moving out of a difficult, broken, despondent place, who knows how a grand plan could get you moving in the new year? In Jeremiah chapter 29, if you go earlier in the chapter, the Israelites <clears throat> were starting to feel stuck in Babylon. And they just figured, well, nothing's gone according to plan, so we're just going to sit here and twiddle our thumbs and bide our time. Uh, but look at what God says to Israel in the midst of their exile. God says in Jeremiah 29 verse, verses 4 to 6, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. You know, I really believe this is a word from God for some people in our church. You've gotten stuck in a place like a Babylon that you didn't see it coming 
and it wasn't what you anticipated, and you've thought, well, I just need to kind of sit tight, and once all these problems pass, then I'll start to get vision, God would say to you, like He said to Israel, listen, even in the midst of Babylon, you can believe to increase and not decrease. You get a grand plan, even in the midst of your trouble, God says, don't get stuck in Babylon. I want you to start to build houses and plant vineyards and start to increase and not decrease. And I believe when you get a grand plan for your future, you're able to start moving ahead in life, even when the circumstances have not yet all resolved and become favorable. You know, Sarah and I have found even this week, as we've started to talk about grand plans for the future and what we believe God is calling us to do and our church to do, it's amazing how you get talking about grand plans and what you could do. It's amazing within about five minutes, your whole mental state changes. Isn't that true? As you start to talk about the possibilities and what if we could believe God for this and who knows where we could be 10 years from now, we could have seven more children 10 years from now. Who knows? That grand plan got shot down. But who knows, as you start to dream, some of us are so focused on what went wrong that you're stuck in fatalism and you need to start to get the cogs of your imagination turning again because as you start to dream, like Abraham, you can get up and get going because a grand plan gets your eyes off the past and onto the future. Come on, who knows, God lives in your future. Your future, your hope is not in the past, it's ahead of you. And so come on, let's run the race that God has got prepared for us. Let's set out and go for it. Don't let 2020 be a repeat of 2019. Get vision in your heart, get faith in your spirit, and start to go after what God has called you to go after. Come on, do you believe that this morning? Number three is this, grand plans will make you grow. Who's believing to grow in 2020? I was in one of our campuses recently and someone came up to me, I've never seen them in my life, and they said, hi, you're Dustin, aren't you? I said, yes. They said, you're much smaller in real life. (laughs) Thanks a lot. I'm believing to grow in 2020. Um, Holidays, of course, um, means travel for some people. Sarah and I chose, we've we've just had a staycation this year, which means once the kids are in bed, you watch some Netflix. And um, I love Um, non-fiction, like documentaries, I love that stuff. Sci-fi is from the devil, but, um, no, seriously. But, But documentaries, God is a God of truth. And so, I love documentaries. So, Sarah and I stumbled upon a documentary, a three-part series called Inside Bill's Brain, Decoding Bill Gates. And Bill Gates, of course, was the founder of Microsoft, but when Bill Gates finished up in his day-to-day role with Microsoft, he had so much money. I mean, what do you do when you've got that much money and you're retired? Well, Bill Gates decided, I'm not just going to sit on a beach and sip from a coconut. He decided, you know what? I've still got plans, and so Bill and Melinda Gates made a grand plan. Their grand plan was, we're going to try to, with all of our capacity, eradicate the illness of polio from the planet. Talk about a grand plan. Some of us are hoping to just eradicate two kilos from our waistline this year. They're believing to eradicate polio. As, um, As I watched the series, it occurred to me that the dream that Bill Gates has dreamed is so great that it literally determines the books that he reads, the people that he meets, the villages that he travels to, the technological development that he finances. And so the man who started out as a software nerd is now far more than a software nerd. He's grown. And who knows, that's what happens when you set a grand plan. When you set a grand plan, it forces you to grow into the vision that you've set before you. Here's a thought. First, The man makes the plan. But then, the plan makes the man. Bill Gates shaped a plan to eradicate polio. He shaped the plan, but who knows, now the plan is shaping the man. That's why some people live very small, petty lives, and all they want to do is gossip about things in the past because they've never shaped a grand plan for the future because you will ultimately grow to the size of your plan. And so if you want to be a big person, set Big plans. Who knows? You'll never know the potential that God has put within you until you raise the bar of your dreams and start to aim high. Grand plans will cause you to grow. You know, we see this in the life of Abraham. 
uh, God comes to Abraham, and, and what I want you to see is God never told Abraham, I'll give you a land, and God never told Abraham, I'll give you a nation. God said to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation, and I will make your name great. You know, many Christians pray, give me prayers. God, give me a bigger income, and God, give me a better house, and God, give me better children, and God, give me a better church, and many Christians pray, pray, give me prayers, but God never promised to give Abraham anything. He promised to make Abraham into something. How would your life look different if instead of praying, give me prayers, you started to pray, make me prayers? Instead of praying, God, give me a better marriage, what if we prayed, Heavenly Father, this year, make me a better husband? Thank you for not amening, Sarah, at that point. (laughs) What if instead of praying, God, give me more finance, what if instead we prayed, God, make me a better steward? Instead of praying, God, give me a better church, what if we prayed, God, make me a better servant and contributor to my local church? I think that the heart of God loves to respond to make me prayers rather than give me prayers. Because whenever God comes with a vision or a promise for your future, it always comes with the promise that he will make us into the people we need to be in order to fulfill the thing that he's called us to do. Who knows, as we said, a lot can happen in 10 years. Who knows, who you are today is not who you were 10 years ago. How many people can say, thank God for that? Who you are is not who you were, and so why not believe that 10 years from now, you could be a completely different person to who you are today? You know, this time 10 years ago, Instagram hadn't been launched. How did people let other people know what they had had for breakfast? (laughs) You know, this time 10 years ago, WhatsApp and Uber were less than 12 months old. This time 10 years ago, Tinder had, never, never mind, that's a different crowd. This time 10 years ago, all of those things, how much can change in 10 years? And so I want to encourage you this morning, who you are right now is not who you will always be. Doesn't the Bible say that God has given his spirit who is at work in us, making us into the people that we need to be? Don't get despondent. Don't quit on your dreams because who you are is not who you're going to be one year from now or 12 years from now. God is working on you. Your capacity can increase, your faith can increase, your skills can increase. Who knows who God is going to introduce you to and connect you with in the next five years, in the next 10 years. So never set your dreams based on where you are. Never set your dreams based on where you were. Always set your dreams based on where you're going to be. And we ought set plans that are so grand that they force us to grow into them so we become people of the full stature that God intended that we be. Can you say amen this morning, church? Number four, the last one, as the band come back, is this. Grand plans will make a difference. I think the reason that God urges us to make grand plans is because I find in my life that left to my own devices... Unless I set a grand plan, we tend to just drift through life being people who spend most of our time and focus and energy just meeting our own needs. And so God comes to us and he tries to shake us out of our selfish human nature and says, come on, set a grand plan that is about someone other than just yourself. Uh, The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren is the best-selling non-fiction hardback in history. The Purpose Driven Life has sold 34 million copies, translated into 70 different languages. And uh, I've actually never read The Purpose Driven Life because I just read the first page and that's all I needed. How efficient is that? The Purpose Driven Life, forget 40 days, I can help you understand it in 40 seconds. The opening chapter, page one, first chapter, first sentence of the Purpose Driven Life says this, it's not about you. Then I closed the book. Saved me 39 days. (laughs) I read that and I thought, I know why God has blessed that book. Because isn't that the heart of God? That Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his, in Luke chapter 4, Jesus announced his grand plan. The spirit of the Lord is upon me to bind up the brokenhearted, to bring recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate those who are captive. Jesus had a grand plan and it was all about other people. And so what's the difference between a plan and a grand plan? 
I believe a plan is when you look out for how you can get more blessed in the next 12 months. But I believe a grand plan, a noble plan, is a plan where you start to say, God, like Abraham, how could you bless me so that I can be a blessing to the people around about me? And, and if you want to set a plan that God will bless, then set a plan that is about other people. Because then you're aligning your life with the heart of God. And so God comes to Abraham and says, listen, it's not about you. I'm going to use you, but it's not about you. It's about the people that you're going to reach and help. Isaiah 32 in verse 8 says that he who is noble or generous plans noble, generous plans. And on these noble things, he stands. Let me ask you a question. If God fulfilled all of your plans this year, like every one of them, how good would that be? But imagine if God fulfilled all of your plans, who would be better off? It's a good way to take stock of your New Year plans, isn't it? Let's imagine God fulfilled every one of these plans that I write down. How many people would be helped? Because if it's just me, uh, probably I've got some plans, but I wouldn't say that they're grand plans. But, but if I could honestly say, if God fulfilled every one of these dreams, man, the people who would be helped, it, then you're starting to dream in a way that resonates with the heart of God. Let me conclude with this thought. The story of Abraham is really this, that God had a grand plan for a childless, nomadic moon worshipper. And God made that man, Abraham, the father of the faith from whom Israel was born and from whom the Saviour would come. And listen, if God could do that for Abraham, a nomadic, childless moon worshipper, then who knows, God could probably do something grand through your life as well. If God could take an Abraham and give him grace and favor to do all of that, then imagine what God could do through your life as well. D.L. Moody, the American evangelist, said this, if God is your partner, make your plans big. And I want to encourage some people this morning in Cairns and Townsville, Emerald, Rockhampton, Gold Coast, Yapoon, I want to encourage us this morning, God is not intimidated by your plans. God is not infuriated when you start to dream. I believe that God wants to, by His Spirit, help us to start to dream dreams and see visions and set grand plans so that we can grow into the people that He's called us to be. Can you say amen this morning, church?